Welcome to Extraterrestrial Reality. Today we are going to completely dismantle the Air Force's uh, explanation for Roswell uh, that involved, according to them, uh, balloon and dummies, crash test dummies. It's going to be dismantled. We're going to bust that balloon wide open today, and that's what we're going to be talking about. And uh, I've had enough, and I think the country has had enough of this. Uh, the world has had enough of this lie, and uh, it's time to uh, get to the truth of the matter. And today, that's what we're going to try to do. And uh, I'm going to present some information with regard to Roswell. Uh, I've been talking about it a lot, of course, on this podcast. Just in the most recent episode, I was talking about the counterintelligence officer, Sheridan Cavett, and his testimony to the Air Force, uh, which was basically false. He told a false story. Uh, he, he claimed that uh, he actually had gone to the debris field at the Brazel Ranch in 1947, along with Jesse Marcel, the uh, top intelligence official in Roswell at the time, at the Roswell Army Air Base in 1947. And he said that right when he saw that material, uh, he knew immediately it was a balloon. Had that been the case then uh, there would have been no press release, right? There would have been no press release the next day uh, stating that the uh, Army Air Force had recovered a flying disc uh, on a ranch in Roswell. That would never have happened if, if what Sheridan said was true. But that's what he told, that's what he put in a statement back in uh, the 1990s when he was approached by uh, Air Force officials who wanted to try to uh, put a lid on the story again. Unfortunately for the Air Force, uh, the, there's, the lid is completely blown off. Uh, uh, researchers over the decades, including people like Donald Schmidt, Thomas Carey, Kevin Randall, uh, Stanton Friedman, those people, people like that, uh, basically kept digging into it, particularly Randall Schmidt and Carey. Those guys did a lot of research uh, back in the 90s, and actually Carey and Schmidt are still putting out books uh, up to this day. Uh, they keep updating them and, and putting them back out again, and they should, because what they have done uh, has shown the world, unfortunately the world is not yet receiving it uh, completely, uh, but they should be. They have proven, uh, in fact, their, their, their most recent book, the Roswell, The Ultimate Cold Case Closed, uh, released, uh, published in 2020, uh, that book pretty much, the, the, they, they named it appropriately, because it is, they, they prove, they have proven these people, these guys have proven that the, that the Air Force has been lying about this. The government has been lying about Roswell. The government is still lying about all these things. Arrow just lied to us again about Roswell, among other things. The All Domain Anomaly Resolution Office. Dr. Sean Kirkpatrick is lying about it. And these guys have proved this was already proven. This stuff is already out there. The information is there. Uh, apparently, uh, the mainstream news doesn't want to do this. Uh, they don't want to investigate it, even though the information is there for the, for the taking. So uh, what I'm going to try to do here today is uh, present, uh, uh, present the information that will show clearly, clearly show that the balloon story, the dummy story particularly, is completely bogus. Uh, the balloon story, we're busting that, we're, we're busting the, the, the dummy story. All of it is coming, coming to a crashing end uh, in this podcast today. I, I'm tired of it. It's time that the uh, mainstream news looks into this. I'll tell you uh, one other thing too. Garrett Graff. Uh, he's that uh, establishment hack author who I've been talking about recently. I, 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 I did a, a review on his book right here. He talked about Roswell too. He, he talked about Roswell in his book, UFO, the inside story of the United States government's search for alien life here and out there. He talked about it too, and guess what? He, he uh, talks about dummies, and he believes that story too. Obviously, this guy did not do any research, and maybe uh, some of the reviewers of his book, uh, like for instance, here, let me pull it up here on the screen. Uh, actually, here's, the Wall, here's what the Wall Street Journal said about Garrett Graff's book. It says, one of the rare books on the topic that manages to be both entertaining and, uh, sit down for this one, factually grounded. After this episode, you are going to know that Garrett Graff's book, particularly when he talks about Roswell, is not grounded in any facts whatsoever. So this is what we're going to do today. We're going to, we're going to smash that balloon story. We're going to smash that uh, dummy story. We're going to bring it all to a crashing conclusion here today. Okay, before we even get started, I just want to—I I, put—I I put 12 points together, which I want to go over, just to get people up to speed on where we're, you know, on what this Roswell situation entails. I put these 12 points together, and we're going to go through them, and then I will go on after that and proceed to destroy uh, the Air Force's contentions that were brought forward in in two different publications by the Air Force that were one in 1994 and another one in 1997 during the 50th anniversary of the Roswell incident. 
Okay, we're gonna go. We're gonna go over these points first, and then we will move on to uh, dismantling the Air Force uh, contention that it was that what was responsible for all the hullabaloo in, in Roswell in 1947 was a secret pro- balloon project called Mogul, uh, and then uh, and then later on people got confused, and what they were remembering as alien bodies were really the recovery of anthropomorphic dubby, dummies using these high altitude uh, drops. We'll get into all of that later on, but first let me just lay out the a prelude here to what we're going to be talking about. <clears throat> I have, tw- like I said, I have 12 different points that I want to go through. Okay, number one, on jo- and this, and before I even go on, all of this information that I'm using, this is from research that has been uh, conducted over over decades by different people, including uh, Donald Schmidt and Thomas Carey. They are the authors of books like this, Roswell, The Ultimate Cold Case Closed, as well as books like this, Witness to Roswell. Uh, and also Kevin Randall. Kevin Randall actually authored this book here, The Truth About the UFO Crash at Roswell, along with Donald Schmidt back in, uh, this book was published in 1994. There was some information from that book too. So there was these books that I have, all the information I'm going to be setting forward today are from these books. Books, these three books, uh, also uh, so, something a little bit from Leonard Stringfield, the, the late UFO investigator uh, who who wrote a lot about UFO crash retrievals. I have some information on that, and as well as from uh, the United States Air Force, uh, their publications. They're the main sources for everything we're going to be talking about today, and I will have links for everything in the description if you want to check it out. But anyway. Let's gonna, I'm going to start off here with uh, going through the 12 uh, points to, to get us going here. Uh, and again, this is all information called from decades of research conducted by people like Schmidt, Carey, uh, Randall, uh, among others. But this is what the th- this is where we are now. This is what the the story is at this point. This is where how, what, what the conclusions that they've arrived at. That different people who have studied this intensely. Those guys, Carey and Schmidt, they they're, 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 they have interviewed in upwards of oh, 600 people. Anyway, can, let's go on here. Number one, on July 3rd, 1947, Mac Brazel, ranch foreman for the Foster Ranch located some 75 miles northwest of Roswell, New Mexico, found a nearly mile-long field litter, littered with strange debris. Sheep wouldn't go near the debris, forcing Brazel to march them around it to graze elsewhere. On July 6th, 1947, Brazel traveled to Roswell with some of the debris and reported it to Sheriff George Wilcox. Wilcox didn't know what the material was and connected Brazel with the Roswell Army Air Field. Roswell Army Airfield Base Commander Colonel William Butch Blanchard ordered the base's top intelligence officer, Major Jesse Marcel, and Captain Sheridan Cavett, who was the counterintelligence officer there at the time, to investigate the debris field. The two accompanied Brazel to the ranch and arrived there on the evening of July 6, 1947. They camped out in an old house on the property. The same day, debris fragments Brazel had brought with him to Roswell were packaged and flown to the Pentagon in Washington, D.C., for examination. On July 7, 1947, Marcel and Cavett spent a good portion of the day collecting debris and loading it into their vehicle. Marcel, during interviews late in life, described the material as unearthly and that it couldn't have come from anything on Earth. Marcel would also state that the material felt weightless and that extremely thin metal he handled was impossible to bend, break, or burn. Even slamming a 16-pound sledgehammer into the metal did nothing. Many other witnesses to Rob Roswell wreckage talked about other metal that looked like thin, unwrinkled aluminum foil. However, when crumpled up, this memory metal would straighten out to its original form again. While Marcel is collecting debris at the Foster Ranch, the final impact site of the craft along with dead alien bodies is discovered about 40 miles north of Roswell. A group of archaeologists come upon the site and are later told to leave the area by Army personnel. Roswell researchers eventually interviewed Dr. W. Curry Holden, who reported that he was the leader of the archaeologists and that the story was true. On the night of July 7th, 1947, Brazel was invited to stay overnight at the home of Walt Whitmore Jr., the owner of local Roswell radio station KGFL. Before retiring for the evening, Whitmore records a detailed statement from Brazel about the materials discovered at his ranch. During the early number seven, during the early morning hours of July 8th, an excited Marcel returns to his home in Roswell and awakens his wife. Vi and son Jesse Jr. because he wants to show the materials from the crashed flying saucer. Jesse Jr. later recalled that the materials included I-beam fragments that featured indecipherable hieroglyphics embossed on them. 
Number eight, Walter Hout, the Roswell Army Air Base Public Information Officer, stated in a sworn affidavit that at 7.30 a.m. on July 8th, he attended a staff meeting where Marcel Cavett Blanchard, Brigadier General Roger Ramey, Ramey's Chief of Staff Thomas DeBose, among others, were present, and all of them handled some of the debris and commented on it. The discovery of the impact site and alien bodies was also discussed. At the time, according to Hout, the Army Air Force, apparently acting on directions from the Pentagon, had intended to admit only to the, to the debris field at the Foster Ranch and the flying saucer remnants found there. Attention needed to be diverted away from the impact site, Hout testified, because too many civilians were already involved and the press already was informed. Later, at 9.30 a.m., Blanchard phoned quote, my office and dictated the press release of having in our possession a flying disc, end quote, outstated in a sworn affidavit. Number nine, at some point on July 8th, Brazel was taken into custody by Army officials. The minority owner of radio station KGFL, George Judd Roberts, was later contacted by the executive secretary of the Federal Communications Commission, T.J. Slowey, who told Roberts if the station aired any portion of Brazel's interview with Whitmore, it would lose its broadcast license. Slowey said the matter involved national security. Just minutes after receiving the threatening call from Slowey, Roberts received a second long-distance call from Washington, this time from the United States Senator Dennis Chavez of New Mexico, who in the strongest words possible, instructed the station to comply with Slowey's demands. Number 10. <clears throat> At radio station KOAT in Albuquerque, New Mexico, on July 8th, Secretary Lydia Sleppy received a call from John McBoyle, a part owner of KOAT, uh, Co KOAT's sister station, KSWS in Roswell, who had a scoop that he wanted Sleppy to put on the newswire immediately. Sleppy alerted ABC News headquarters of a big story incoming as McBoyle began to tell it. He stated a flying disc had crashed near Roswell, that it looked like a big crumpled dishpan, and that there's talk of little men being on board. No sooner did Sleppy begin writing the report on the teletype machine when a bell on it alerted her of an incoming message. The message, message was sent from the FBI and stated, Attention Albuquerque, do not transmit, repeat, do not transmit this message. Stop communication immediately. National security matter. McBoyle, uh, actually, while actually Sleppy uh, uh, confirmed this to investigators years later, because this story originally came up in the uh, 1970s, uh, and she confirmed it later on. McBoyle, meanwhile, was forced by someone on the, on the other end of the call to end his phone conversation. Number 11, because of the press release issued by the Roswell Army Airfield, the story of the disc recovery at the Foster Ranch landed on the front page of the Roswell Daily Record on the afternoon of July 8th. It was picked up by other news agencies and radio stations, and for a brief few hours that day, the world had known at least part of the truth about the crashed flying disc. And then finally, number 12, on the afternoon of July 8th, Blanchard ordered Marcel to fly saucer debris to Wright Field in Ohio. Marcel boarded a bomber and on his lap was a box filled with some of the debris. The flight was diverted, however, to the base at Fort Worth, Texas. Upon arriving, Marcel went into Ramey's office and handed over the box filled with debris. Ramey brought Marcel into another room and asked him to point out the debris site on a large wall map. Ramey informed Marcel that they were about to meet with the press and to allow Ramey to do all the talking. When they went back into the room, the box with debris was gone and replaced with obvious remnants from a weather balloon and radar reflectors. Ramey then told reporters that officers from Roswell had made a mistake and the object was merely the weather balloon. Marcel was ordered to pose holding remnants of the balloon. So that is, uh, the, uh, just to get us started here, I wanted to point some of these things out so people understand what the situation really was going on back there at the time. Uh, uh, the Air Force, the government, they don't want to talk about these uh, aspects to the to this story at all. Uh, but uh, I do. I do want to talk about them. I think everybody else wants to talk about them too. I'm getting sick of this. I'm sick, I'm sick of the cover-up. I'm sick of the nonsense. And it's time that we, we bust this, this Air Force balloon. Now, of course, as I was talking about in the previous podcast, there was a report. Or actually, what happened was this. 
in the uh, you know early 1990s, there was a lot of pressure. The Air Force was feeling a lot of pressure because this Roswell story kept on getting bigger and bigger and bigger as time went on. You know, Marcel. You know, it wasn't until 1978 until he went public with what he said was a cover up, and that whatever crashed out there was definitely not a balloon, and it was something not of this earth. That's what he said. He was very clear about that on mul- during multiple interviews. Um, uh, and, uh, so I, I have talked about this in previous podcasts. And so that was, so that came out in 78. And then there was a book written, the Roswell incident. It was published in 1980. Again, at that time, when these books first started getting published and even books like this, the truth, you know, in 1994, books like this, the truth about the UFO crash at Roswell, a lot of things were incomplete. Some of the witnesses were, were later impeached, you know, like, like some of them, some of the witnesses who had stepped over, stepped forward when the story started breaking over the years, some of them turned out to be not that reliable some of them kept changing their story but there were a lot of other witnesses too that you don't really hear about and that the air force doesn't talk about at all actually in their reports and some of their in these reports that they put out they actually uh they were feeling pressure there was this representative stephen schiff from who was from new mexico and uh, he was asking questions he uh and the general accounting office in washington was going to do it said they, they were going to do an investigation in the roswell and come up with a report so while that was going on, the Air Force, without telling anybody, came up with its own report. They went around, started interviewing everyone. They wanted to get ahead of this, obviously. And with by the end of 1994, they had amassed this uh, almost a thousand page long report to tell the world that what it what it was was it wasn't a weather balloon like they talked about in uh 1947 that was a lie it was actually a top secret kind of balloon called part of a project mogul a project by the way that by uh the, by the time this air force report came out was already declassified like over 20 years before so it wasn't like mogul was any big secret at the time but that's what they tried to claim they basically what it was was like a shell game they they tried to confuse everything went out there okay yeah see the reason we had to keep it secret the reason it was all this hullabaloo about the about this weather balloon it was this was part of this top secret uh uh project we had ongoing called project mogul what was interesting about this whole thing though is and which was something that's not mentioned in the uh air forces uh you know they don't want to talk about this part was that the the guy who was in charge of this project mogul this uh this meteorological physicist will uh charles b moore uh he was actually approached by one of the original roswell researchers back in 1979 william moore and when william moore explained what the 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 description of the debris field and everything charles b moore said there's no way that a a mogul balloon could ever account for something like that but then in the early 90s when when the air force uh, was trying to look for people to help, uh, you know, put an explanation together for them that, you know, to help uh, with this new uh, uh, scenario that they're trying to create. That it was, yeah, we are there that the Air Force, that the Army Air Force at the time it wasn't the Air Force yet. Uh, by a year later, it would be the the, the, the United the, at the time in 1947. It was the United States Army Air Force. Basically, the the Air Force was a division of the Army. That became its own, by 1948. The Air Force was its own separate. Uh, entity but anyway uh, they went to more apparently and more try basically and according to the research to uh, of, of schmidt and carey in in uh, roswell the cold uh, the ultimate cold case closed uh more basically falsified data to basically place this one of his mogul balloons that was allegedly lost uh, at, at the foster ranch and that would explain the uh, why what, what the mix up and but here's an interesting thing you know recently um you know I, i've been watching some uh, on the recent uh, Richard Dolan podcast, he's, he was pointing out how ridiculous this explanation is. And he actually showed a picture of what a mogul balloon looks like. And basically it's this, you know, balloons carrying with string on it with, with a whole bunch of these uh, rec- these triangular like uh, foil covered pieces of cardboard. I mean, it's obvious that it's not anything special right and and the and for the for the air force to say in 1994 in their in this report that they came out with that was called the Razo report uh fact versus fiction in the new mexico desert for, for them to say that that someone like jesse marcel a top intelligence official would confuse this 
uh, f- would confuse the, uh, a fallen mogul balloon for uh, a flying saucer. I mean, that's insane. It's a, it's absurd. He, actually, not only that, for he was the top intelligence official at the only atomic bomb site on the whole planet at the time. So that that you're trying to they're trying to tell you that he was so stupid that he mistook this for uh, uh, for a flying saucer, this weather balloon. And not only that, but Colonel William Blanchard, who would later be promoted and become a general, that he also made these mistakes too. And among other people, a lot of people. And we also have the testimony of people like uh, the communications officer, Walter Howd, who plainly, clearly states that it was a cover-up and they, there was no balloon. It was no balloon at all. So that's abs- absolutely uh, ridiculous. That whole explanation is ridiculous. So they came out with this report in 1994, but they didn't. the Air Force didn't address anything in that report about the claims of alien bodies. So during the 50th anniversary of Roswell in 1997, all of a sudden they come out with this other book, uh, <clears throat> This one right here, Ros- the Razo Report, Case Closed, which I've talked about a number of times before. We're going to pull some, some sections of this book up on the screen and go over it. And this is where you're going to find out that this whole story, is p- p- the, the dummies is completely off the table. Off the, that's done. The dummies is off the table. The air, the weather balloon is off, has been off the table, but the dummies are they're off the table. It's that, that this is it's all fiction. This is completely made up. Anything that the Air Force says in here, it does it makes no difference, and you will see why uh, later on as we go through this. But anyway, uh, let's just I want to go through a couple of different uh, sections here. I guess we're going to start off. Okay, yeah. The, uh, early on in the book, uh, uh, they're talking about what these balloons are and, and what they came, how they came to this conclusion that maybe what people were really seeing was uh, these anthropomorphic dummies uh, and not aliens, and they mistook these dummies that were dropped from from high altitudes for for alien creatures, which is abs- I, like I always talk about on the show that this is an absurd. It's just an absurd uh, assertion to make, right? But they do are making this assertion. But you know, the whole issue is is that it, it, it they make this assertion. It takes time to go through the, the reasons why it's absurd. And that's what I want to do here. I want to go through the reasons why it's absurd. Uh, but before we even go there, I want to just touch on one thing with regard to uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, this claim that people were, that it was a bal- balloon fragments. Now, uh, the, now, for one thing, apparently uh, this more to, to, help, to help the Air Force in 1994, he basically... I, you know, according to the research con- conducted by Donald Schmidt and Thomas Carey, he falsified data. He had to. There was the only way he could try to make one of these balloons fall at the Foster Ranch, right? But that, it, again, it doesn't matter because that's not what people saw. Like Jesse Marcel claimed that the the, the, the section of field was three and a, three uh, about three quarters of a mile long and uh, several hundred uh, yards wide, several hundred feet wide. So that's a balloon would not the, the, uh, the remnants of a mogul balloon would not be able to fill up uh, a, a, an area of, of of land that that way with uh, with the remnants if it fell down it just it doesn't make sense that's why when Sheridan Cavett testified in favor of uh, of this uh, Air Force story back in 1994 he stated that it was only 20 feet 20 square feet the area that's why he said that and now you have to keep in mind too that Cavett when he was approached by uh, researchers before never said a word and I'm not going to get into too much with Cavett today because I did I talked about him extensively in the previous episode and if you missed that I, I recommend that you check it out however uh, so more and it seems uh, it seems that uh, Moore and his uh, Sheridan Cavett they they both provided false information in an effort to help the Air Force. That's what this appears strongly appears like. It must be right. It has to be based on the testimony of so many other people. Now, uh, like Marcel said, there was just so much stuff they couldn't even pick it up. In fact, there was other people, but the soldiers were brought to that debris field on multiple occasions to go through it, to comb through it, and make sure every piece of, of scrap was picked up. Every piece of debris was removed and dropped into a burlap bag. Now, this is one of the things that the Air Force didn't keep in mind when they were doing these reports, or, or, or even up to this day. Arrow didn't keep this in mind, actually, I should say. Uh, you know, while, while the Air Force was... was 
uh, coming up with these reports in 1994 and then 1997, Roswell researchers were still looking for for witnesses, and they were, and that's what was happening. They were still finding more and more people. There was some of the witnesses they they had already talked to, but the Air Force, like some military witnesses, they had talked to previously to uh, uh, to the release of any of those Air Force books, those Air Force reports. But the Air Force didn't they didn't want to mention them because that would destroy their the narrative that they were trying to create. We'll get into that later too. Uh, and there were other witnesses after the fact that researchers had talked to. One of them was this uh, Sergeant Errol Fulford. This is something that someone that uh, Schmidt and Carey talked to. And, and uh, according to their reporting, Sergeant Errol Fulford was stationed in Roswell in 1947. He told investigators he was part of a detail that was driven to the debris field on the Floster Ranch where Mac Brazel found UFO wreckage. Fulford told researchers Donald Schmidt and Thomas Carey that he and a team of service men were handed burlap bags and told to pick up all the debris on a section of ground measuring hundreds of yards. Fulford also said that it had appeared that the area had already been policed and scoured as there were tire tracks everywhere. There wasn't much debris remaining, but Fulford did describe finding a small piece of memory metal. When they completed picking up the debris, the servicemen handed in their burlap bags, were searched thoroughly upon completion of the task, and then told not to say anything about the incident or be court-martialed. So I just wanted to point that out. See, there's another witness that that corroborates what Jesse Marcel was saying about the the debris field at the, uh, on the Foster Ranch. So that was something that needs to be pointed out. There's, it wasn't a balloon, folks. It had nothing to do with any weather balloon or mogul balloon. See, that was just all of uh, th- what the Air Force tried to do there. There's really not that much difference between a weather balloon and a mogul balloon, really. It's just their weather, their balloons. The, the mogul balloon, just like a weather balloon, was made with r- rubber balloons. And and, and the Air Force wants you to believe that these all these people made a mistake and, and thought that this stuff was remnants of a flying saucer, a, a lousy balloon with some tin foil and and, and string and some pieces of balsa wood that's all it was and a little radio uh, receiver on there because they're trying what they're trying to do with that stuff they're trying to detect when the soviets uh, uh detonated their first atomic bomb that's what they were trying to do with those balloons that's what it was all about but anyway now i'm going to go to this uh, 1997 roswell report case closed that the air force had put put out and uh, we're going to just tear this thing to pieces Okay, uh, at one point they talk here about, uh, now this is on the digital version that I'm looking at. This is page 28. The pages are different on the on the physical version. So I'm just going to tell you on the pages on this digital version, and I'll leave the link so you can check all the stuff out for yourself. You have to see this stuff to believe it, actually. It's an incredible piece of fiction beyond imagination. Anyway... Uh, it talks about high-altitude research balloons. It says, The only vehicles not yet evaluated as a possible source of the accounts were high-altitude research balloons. Previous reviews of early research balloon flight records revealed that trajectories of high-altitude balloons were, at times, unpredictable and did not usually remain over Holloman Air Force Base or White Sands Missile Range. Many of the scientific payloads required recovery, so the data collected during flight could be returned to the laboratory for analysis. These characteristics seem to fit at least some of the research profile, atmospheric sampling apparatus or weather instruments. The typical payload of many high-altitude balloons could hardly have been mistaken for space aliens. A careful examination of the instruments carried aloft by the high-altitude balloons revealed that one unique project used a device that very likely could, could be mistaken for an alien, an anthropomorphic dummy. An anthropomorphic dummy is a human substitute equipped with a variety of instrumentation to measure effects of environments and situations deemed too hazardous for a human. These abstractly human dummies were first used in New Mexico in May 1950 and have been used on a continuous basis since that time. And it says here, it says, In the 1950s, anthropomorphic dummies were not widely exposed outside of scientific research circles and easily could have been mistaken for something they were not. Today, anthropomorphic dummies, better known as crash test dummies, are easily identifiable and even the stars of their own automotive safety advertising campaign. So, what they're trying to tell you here is that these dummies in 1950... Uh, people were seeing these dummies and, and from they, they were doing these experiments from uh, 1953 to 1959 um, and basically the ex- any any of the balloon drops uh, that would have occurred near near Roswell ha- didn't start happening until 1954 uh, but anyway it, it, all of this is as you will see it's all beside the point for one thing 
uh, they're saying here anthropomorphic dummies were not widely exposed outside of scientific research center and that it would be easy for people to make that mistake if they saw if they say saw an, uh, an anthropomorphic dummy but that's not true anthropomorphic dummies are really no different than mannequins and if you look up the definition of mannequins uh, one of the definitions is dummy and you would have to believe you have to believe that anybody who uh, are uh, would would believe with this c contention that the air force is putting out that, that these little beings that people saw were actually these full you know 6 foot tall 200 pound dummies that were dropped from high altitudes it's absolutely absurd but uh, we're going to continue here hold on i'm going to go to another page here where they talk about this a little bit more Okay, it talks about the high-altitude balloon dummy drops. It says, from 1953 to 1959, anthropomorphic dummies were used by the United States Air Force Aero Medical Laboratory as part of the high-altitude aircraft escape projects High Dive and Excelsior. The object of these studies was to devise a method to return a pilot or astronaut to Earth by parachute if forced to ex escape at extreme altitudes. Uh, and then it goes on telling you how they accomplished all these things. But you know, uh, and, and the dummy launch, it says here, there were 43 high-altitude balloon flights carrying six, 67 anthropomorphic dummies, and they were launched and recovered throughout New Mexico between June 1954 and February 1959. Uh, so it was actually between 54 and 59, not 53. There was In 53, there were additionally 30 dummies were dropped by aircraft right over White Sands Proving Ground, New Mexico, in 1953. So that's they, they the, the ones that were dropped in 53, they can't be considered as uh, uh, potential uh, mistakes, or p potential uh, things that witnesses would have saw. But, you know, that, that's that. Can't, so it's really just from 1954 to 1959. But again, none of this, as you see, ma it matters not. It None of it matters. All this is nonsense. There's no point in even talking about this. The Air Force really made a stupid mistake with this. Uh, but we're going to go through it anyway because uh, it needs to be exposed. Okay, now we're going to move on to uh, a map that they have here. The anthropomorphic dummy launch and landing locations. Okay, let me just scroll down here. Now you can see um, there's... You can see right here, I'm looking at a, a, they have the crash site number one, which is, the, this is the one that was 40 miles north of Roswell, okay? And then the, the debris field on the Foster Ranch was approximately 75 miles northwest of Roswell. And then they also have this crash site two mentioned over here, which is the San, uh, on, the, on the plains of San Augustine. Now, Roswell researchers today will tell you that this has nothing to do with the Roswell crash. This, the, what happened here, there was this... Uh, uh, guy, he was a, a soil conservation engineer, Grady Barney Barnett. And uh, when stories of uh, the Roswell incident started, uh, people started hearing this, there was some people who remembered, a uh, people who knew Barney Barnett, who had passed away in the 60s, remembered a story he had told. One of his best friends, Vern Maltese, came forward and went to researchers and told them about a story. He was told by Barney Barnett, he, he, he said uh, Barnett had... Uh, he was driving in New Mexico but, uh, s somewhere and he came upon uh, what looked like something was crashed off the, he saw it from, you know, and he and he went to see what it was. And when he got there, he saw that it would look like a flying saucer crashed and there were dead alien bodies there. And uh, and and right when he got there, there was a, a group of archaeologists that showed up. And uh, and not soon after that, army personnel showed up, told them to all get out of there and swore them all the secrecy and never to talk about it again. And uh, Barnett had told this story to Vern Maltese uh, apparently in 1950. And he also had told his niece, another per another witness, a secondhand witness, Alice Knight, and, she, and and those two people, Vern Maltese and Alice Knight, were, were two of the two secondhand witnesses. And they were two of the key witnesses the, that the Air Force tried to use, that they did use. They used in this report, this uh, Roswell uh, report case closed from 1997 to explain the dummies. They used those two witnesses to explain that. But uh, apparently, what he was saying, what Barnett was saying, that, you know, to, to these people was that uh, they had, they were under the assumption he was that this occurred at the, on the plains of San Augustine. Now, some UF, UFO researchers, like the late Stanton Friedman, believed that maybe what happened here was that. Uh, two ufos crashed into each other at the same time and one of them ended up landing eventually in the in the plains of san augustine while the other one came down at uh uh you know uh, 40 miles uh, north of roswell uh now other re research has shown by this point there was was it doesn't seem like there were two saucers involved in this uh, although uh 
Friedman believed this. I never, I, ne- I never agree with them. I agree with the research that was conducted by other people because there was, it was too flimsy. The San Augustine story was too flimsy. There was nothing there. Uh, so that's what basically happened with that. So, uh, but, but they used two, those two secondhand witnesses. They only had a handful of witnesses that the Air Force talked about in their report to, to, uh, to try to justify this explanation of dummies, of people mistaking dummies. And we'll get into that later. But anyway... Uh, on this map, you can see where they had that crash site too. The, they call it with the, on the plains of San Augustine, which is bogus. That's not. It doesn't seem like that's happened. Now it's unclear at this point. Researchers will tell you that uh, you know the Barney Barnett story has to be dismissed because we there, you only have that you only really had a, a couple of second hand two or three. It was actually more than two. There was other second hand witnesses that heard Barnett had telling this story before, and he was very sincere about it. They say he was a believable person, but you know. There were some archaeologists that were that uh, there, that team of archaeologists that he was talking about. Uh, there there were people that claimed there was at least the guy who was leading them. This W. Curry Holden uh, said it was north of Roswell, and that the story that the story of archaeologists coming upon this site is true. So maybe somehow Barnett w- was actually in the Roswell area at the time, and maybe that's what happened. There's no research though to prove that. But anyway, that's 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 a different story for another day. What the Air Force is saying here is that uh, they're trying to say that people who saw alien bodies, who claim to have seen alien bodies, what they really saw was these, were these anthropomorphic dummies. And one of the witnesses was this Barney Barnett, who had been long dead at this time, and they're using the testimony of two secondhand witnesses who told them the story, this Vern Maltese and Alice Knight. They were featured uh, a lot you know, in this report. But anyway, if you, you look at this and they tell you, you can see on this map here that they provided, there's all these little triangles uh, from where these uh, bo- these balloon launches with these dummies were, were, were sent off. And then you have these squares where they tell you where they came down. Now, the two closest ones are number 33 and number 16. And when you go to uh, those pages to find out what, where, where they were, when, when they came down, and you can see that they're not anywhere really near. They're, the closest one to any of the sites, to the debris field and to the crash site, was number 33. You can see that that looks like it's the closest one. But then when you go into the key at, at later on uh, in the back of the book uh, that tells you where, when these balloons were launched and when they were recovered, you, you, it tells you a different story here. Uh, hold on one second. Okay, uh, here's this uh, altitude, the high altitude balloon dummy drops and the landing sites and the dates. So, uh, no, hold on. So, if you go to number 16, that was the one that was the closest one, eight miles northwest of Roswell. That was on, uh, in the, the, the recovery was in 1955, November of 1955. And that one, and then you go to number 33 and you see that one, that, that was, that recovery happened in 1957. So that's 10 years after the event occurred. So what the, but the, what the Air Force contends in this book, however, is that, uh, uh, these people suffered from time compression, all these, uh, these reports from the different people. But again, they, they really didn't have that many reports, a good, they didn't really have good witnesses, uh, so the two of the witnesses that they used to, to put this report together uh, were two secondhand witness, witnesses talking about this Barney Barnett uh, account, right? Which, which by this point, by not, well, long before 1997, years before 1997, a lot of Roswell researchers were already discounting because, and they couldn't can really connect it with Roswell. They just didn't have enough data. So the, he, was, he was actually someone who was discounted, but they were using two secondhand witnesses to come up with this balloon story, uh, of the two second eyewitnesses to this Barney Barnett uh, uh, story to come up with the help come up with this balloon story. Another person that they were uh, that they went that they another alleged witness was this guy named Gerald Anderson who came forward uh, around 1990 claiming that uh, he was five years old and he was with some family members when they stumbled upon a, a crashed saucer and dead alien bodies. But uh, long before 1997, Roswell researchers showed that this guy was not telling the truth. I mean, he actually, uh, he kept changing his stories. And then not only that, uh, changing the location of it, where it happened. And then finally, it, cu- it culminated when he uh, presented a, an alleged diary from one of his uncles who was allegedly at this crash site with them. 
And uh, it turned out that the diary was phony, that it was that he made it. They, they determined that the ink was what was that was used to write the diary wasn't made in, wasn't produced until sometime in the 1970s. So all these holes start popping up in Gerald Anderson's story long before 1997, long before the Air Force decided to put this story their their uh, uh, ex explanation together on on these on these uh, balloon dummies. Uh, and so, and then one of the other witnesses was a James Ragsdale, uh, and he's someone who, after 1997, Roswell researchers dismissed his claims because uh, he kept changing his story too. So, so these were the main witnesses that the Air Force used to come up with this balloon dummy story that these these dummies lo lofted up on on these balloons and high altitudes and then dropped to Earth. Uh, it came from these set of witnesses, but it, in, in the end, as you'll see, it doesn't matter anyway. Even, don't, none of it matters. This is all total fiction. The story that they put together is total fiction. Now, some of the statements you could go to this table that they have here, uh, and this is on page seventy-eight. Uh, they come to these. You have a table, and 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 some of the little they take out little statements from some of the witnesses, like this James Ragsdale. Uh, he 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 said something that like they were using dummies in those damn things. Uh, you, if you read what uh, uh, Rag, Ragsdale's testimony, he says that they could. I didn't know what they was dummies or or, or bodies or what. They, maybe they was using dummies in those damn things. So they so they started taking these statements from some of these witnesses, bad witnesses too. It's probably the worst witnesses that they could have gotten. Now I'm not saying that. Uh, uh, the the two Vern Maltese and and Alice Knight were bad witnesses. They were secondhand witnesses, though, and that was to the Barney Barnett story, which really uh, Roswell investigators are unable to connect with the to the Roswell incident to, uh, still to this day. So they, they it wasn't the best witnesses. And here's what the thing and I that I noticed uh, when I've been researching this the last couple of weeks is that I I'm realizing now. They didn't use any of the military witnesses, none of them. There, and, and there were a lot of them. And actually, they had to know about some of them like uh, before they put this report together, but they didn't go there because if they had, then that would completely destroy their the narrative that they wanted to put out there. It, it's incredible. But anyway, let's go through some of this table here. It says, and then there's another uh, comment here that they pl pulled from... Uh, uh, Gerald Anderson, one of the things he said was, I thought they were plastic dolls, okay? And and then the Air Force says, okay, this is a reference to anthropomorph anthropomorphic dummies that had plastic skin. Then they have a, a one, one comment here they have in this table is from somebody who has no connection to Roswell whatsoever. This was a... a, a, a this was a Lieutenant Colonel William Kaufman who, ha who, who was involved... Uh, in, in, a, in a balloon accident in 1959 in Roswell, 12 years after the incident, where two of two other service members got injured, and one of them, one of the service members' head got swollen up. So they interviewed this guy as as if this guy is going to provide any sort of uh, uh, relevant information to this this uh, research that they're trying to conduct. And he really, but they, they went to him because they needed people to to talk on their side. And this guy had nothing to do with in, with Roswell in 1947. But he says here. They, they just pull out a small little comment that he gave them. An experimental plane with dummies in it. And then the Air Force explanation next to that says reference to anthropomorphic dummies. And then another one here from Ragsdale. I'm sure that was bodies, either bodies or dummies. And then say that the Air Force says reference to anthropomorphic dummies. And then another one from Rag, Ragsdale. It was either dummies or bodies or something laying there. And the, so the, the Air Force is trying to tell you. I see it's just a, obviously it's a reference to anthropomorphic dummies. Uh, here's one from Anderson. His eyes was open, staring blankly. Oh, obviously, it's a reference to anthropomorphic dummies. Uh, not exact. And, and some of the in more interesting comments actually came from Maltese and Knight, and they weren't uh, saying anything about dummies. They were saying things like, "His eyes was open." Or, excuse me. Not exactly like human beings, similar, but not exactly. Maltese said in, in talking about what he recalled, what uh, 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 Barnett had told him. Of course, the Air Force concludes here, well, that's obviously a reference to anthropomorphic dummies. Uh, Alice Knight said, well, she remembered Barnett saying something like, it didn't look like human beings. Well, obviously, according to the Air Force, that's a reference to anthropomorphic dummies. Uh, uh, and then another one here from Anderson. They didn't have a little finger. Uh, basically, Anderson, like other uh, witnesses, claimed that uh, they only had four fingers. And now a lot of people said that there were already witnesses before he stepped forward that were saying this, by the way, just to keep that in mind. 
And uh, what does uh, the Air Force say to that? That's a reference to an Alderson Laboratories dummy that were reused many times and were often damaged but remained in service. So what the Air Force was trying to tell people here, too, is that be the, the, when people saw only four fingers on these dummies, uh, that meant that obviously one of the fingers broke off because they were using them over and over again. They're you know, wooden hands, so that, that's what they're trying to say. Okay, uh, let's go to the next page here. I could continue with this nonsense a little bit. Uh, here was a, a description from Maltese uh, in reference to what Maltese was told by Barnett. It says the beings were three and a half to four feet tall. And what, what does the Air Force say? Well, obviously, this is likely a description of anthropomorphic dummy missing legs after a fall from a high altitude. Uh, here's one from Anderson. The beings, the beings were four foot tall, four and a half feet tall. And the Air Force, this is a corroboration of what we just said. This corroborates it. See, it broke off its legs. Uh, so that's just how it goes. You, you look at this. Uh, uh, here's one from Maltese. Uh, their heads were hairless. No eyebrows, no eyelashes, no hair. Well, the Air Force is con uh, concludes, obviously, anthropomorphic dummies, they didn't have hair. So obviously that explains it. And it goes on and on and on like this. You have to go through this. Uh, they were here's one from Anderson. They were all wearing one piece suits, a shiny, shiny silverish gray color. And then the Air Force says, uh, reference to gray flight suits worn by the dummies for some of the tests. Tests. Now I'm going to look at some of the pictures of the dummies they're talking about here. The the clothing on these dummies was very loose, very loose. But again, none of this really matters. In the final analysis, you'll realize that none of this matters. This is all bogus. This is all nonsense because. Uh, they, they, there were other witnesses that they never talked about. And, and we're going to talk about that here uh, as we go through it. But anyway, I want to go to a, to a summary here that they put together before we do that, that the Air Force had in that book and why this is bogus. It says here, uh, I'm not going to read the whole thing. They, but here's a statement they make. This is, this is an assertion they make in this book. It says, It is clear anthropomorphic dummies were responsible for these accounts, the specific, but it's at the specific locations of the de events described was difficult. Uh, it was difficult for them to determine. But they're saying it's clear. It's clear that anthropomorphic dummies were responsible for these accounts. It's very clear to them. For one thing, again, the... The Barney Barnett story. Now, Vern Maltese, let's just consider this. He said that Barnett told him this story in 1950. They didn't start doing those dummy drops until 1953. And, and it wasn't until 1954 when they started doing them all throughout New Mexico. Okay? So that can't be true, right? That just, just keep that in mind. And another thing, too, is Barnett... Uh, it's still, he has, he's not connected with the, researchers have been unable to connect him really to Roswell. It might be that he was there. It might be. Maybe he, maybe his story is true and, and maybe the, the people he told, the secondhand witnesses who, who were later interviewed by UFO researchers as well as the Air Force, uh, they just misremembered certain things of it. So unfortunately, Barnett was long dead by this, by this point. So there was no way to verify anything with him. But just think of that, though. They're saying there, uh, they're making, they're saying, though it is clear anthropomorphic dummies were responsible. They're making that statement that it's clear. How is it clear? It's not clear whatsoever. And then, of course, Gerald Anderson, by 19, 1997, in fact, in this book here, The Truth About the UFO Crash at Roswell by Kevin Randall and Donald Schmidt, that they had uh, impeached Gerald Anderson as a witness, and that was in 1994, long before the Air Force uh, uh, used Gerald Anderson's comments to come up with their excuse, uh, their dummy excuse, long before. So it's all bogus, folks. It's all bogus. And here, now we're going to talk about something. We're going to show you here what they don't include in here. And this is where everything falls to pieces for them. Okay. Um, let's look at this one. Okay. Private Frank Cassidy. Okay, these, there, there were people that they never interviewed. And some of them, to, to, um, you know, uh, UFO researchers didn't discover until after 1997. But some of them uh, w were, were known, were known before 1997. Okay, but let's go through all of them anyway. It says here, uh, this is information, again, this is from books uh, written by Schmidt and Carey. Private Frank Cassidy, an MP in Roswell in 1947, told his wife on his deathbed in 1976 that he had guarded Hangar 3 in Roswell and saw alien bodies. Uh, Corporal 
Robert Lida, on his deathbed in 1995, told his wife that he served as a guard at Hangar 3 in Roswell in 1947 and saw wreckage and alien bodies. Okay, uh, Sergeant Homer Rowlett Jr. told his son Larry and daughter Carlene on separate occasions while he was on his deathbed in 1988 that he was part of the cleanup detail at the impact site, which was 40 miles north of Roswell, saw the crashed craft and handled the memory metal, and also saw three alien creatures with big heads and that one of them was still alive. Okay, Sergeant Melvin Brown, on his deathbed in 1986, told his family members that he and another soldier were ordered to stand guard by an ambulance near the crash site in 1947 and to not look under a canvas tarp that was covering something in the rear of the vehicle. Brown said he looked under the tarp when the chance arose and saw small alien bodies that had big heads and slanted eyes. Uh, here's one. Private Eli Benjamin told researchers Schmidt and Carey, and this was in the early 2000s, this was about five years after the, this Roswell report came out from the, from, the, uh, uh, from the Air Force. It says here, Private Eli Benjamin told research, researchers Schmidt and Carey that in July 1947, he was ordered to move alien bodies on gurneys from Hangar 3 into trucks bound for the air base hospital. One of the bodies on a gurney appeared to be moving, he said. When getting loaded, uh, getting loaded onto a truck, a sheet on one of the gurneys slipped, allowing Benjamin to see that it was an alien body with a big head. He had nightmares about this incident for the rest of his life. And I would also like to add that Benjamin also said that when he first arrived there, he actually uh, was put in charge of, of this detail to take care of these bodies. But there was somebody else that was there when he got there, uh, somebody, who, uh, other, somebody else who was in charge, but he was freaked. The person was freaking out because he couldn't believe what he was seeing. And, he, and that, that, there was all this commotion when he first got there and he would learn why the guy was freaking out because this guy, this, this, uh, some, a superior to him, had seen these bodies and it just rocked his, rocked his world. And it actually rocked Benjamin's world too. Benjamin, by the way, was uh, very reluctant to talk about this. His actually, his, his he had told his wife, and his wife actually had told researchers, and it took the researchers a while to finally pry out this this truth from Benjamin. Uh, and, and just think about this too. Uh, Benjamin was somebody that was discovered in 2005. Now the Arrow report just came out, and doc, you know, which was put together with doc, you know by Dr. Sean Kirkpatrick. Well, why wasn't there anything in there about some of these other witnesses that have stepped forward since the Air Force? What, what instead, what Arrow did was they just went by what was already on the record. They didn't. They did zero research. Zero research. Actually, Sean Kirkpatrick deserves all the criticism that he's been getting lately. That guy is a liar. He didn't do his job. He didn't do his research. And people in the in Congress need to be looking at this stuff, and 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 this this proves that Kirkpatrick didn't do his job. All he did was just go back to those old Air Force reports and did nothing else. He just took it for gospel. He didn't think to talk to these other people. How come the Air Force never talked to any of these people? How come they didn't consider their uh, testimony uh, when they're putting their dummy report together? And as you can see, this this completely collapses the dummy report, the dummy story. It destroys it. It destroys it. The, all these things happened in 1947. All these people were stationed in Roswell in 1947. This, was, this is proven. It was proven. It's proved these researchers have proved that they they did background checks on all these people. They got the history of they know where they were. They weren't how could they have been what the, the reason that the Air Force did not put this information in that these any witnesses like this in their in their dummy story, right? Is because then that that would immediately cause a dummy story to completely collapse. Okay, here's here's somebody here. Uh Army Air Force pilot Pappy Henderson. Okay, now this guy uh he was known at this time. He was known in, in, by 1997, right? This guy, he, he had already talked to, there, there, there was research done on this guy. His wife had talked about what he, he stated. How come the Air Force didn't include uh, his uh, uh, story in their report, in, in their uh, dummy story? It's, okay, here's what, uh, this is from research from uh, Carrie and Schmidt. It says here, Army Air Force pilot Pappy Henderson said he flew bodies from Roswell to Wright Field in Dayton, Ohio in 1947. He never mentioned the event to his wife until 1982 when he saw a report about the Roswell UFO crash featured on the front page of a newspaper on a stand. Henderson told his wife, Sappho, that he wanted to tell her the story for years and believed that, now that it had been reported in newspapers, it was finally okay to talk about it. Before he passed away, Pappy Henderson said the alien creatures reminded him of the cartoon character 
Casper the Friendly Ghost. Okay, uh, let's talk about that now. Let's talk about that now. Now, Casper the Friendly Ghost. I'm just going to pull this picture up here so you can see what Casper looks like. Casper the Friendly Ghost was a cartoon character created by Famous Studios, which was a division of Paramount. Uh, back in 1945, there was a, over 50 theatrical shorts that featured Casper the Friendly Ghost that ran that were shown in movie theaters from 1945 to 1959. That's who Pappy Henderson said uh, the uh, creatures reminded him of, Casper the Friendly Ghost. Now, this is a picture of Casper the Friendly Ghost. Um, now I'm going to show some pictures of some dummies. These are some of the dummies that the Air Force wants you to think people made mistakes about. Um, and you see there's, you know, keep Casper in mind. Now look at the dummies, right? The dummies, again, they're just like mannequins. Mannequins were around a long time. Mannequins were around, uh, you know, since the 15th century. Basically, uh, there used to be miniature. And then in the 1800s, they, they started making bigger ones, life-size ones. Uh, and by 1940s, by the 1940s, they were in all department stores. You found you would find them in all department store windows throughout department stores. There were mannequins everywhere. Nobody back in 1947 would ever must have mistaken uh, a dummy, a, an anthropomorphic dummy, for uh, uh, for an, an, an extraterrestrial. No, that's not going to happen because, for one thing, they weren't even dropping those dummies in 1947. They didn't start dropping them from the skies until 1953. And all of these people that have testified here, all of these military officials that have testified here, uh, are telling you that uh, that they were there in 1947 and that they played a part. They saw bodies. These all these people I've just uh, talked about here saw the bodies, and they don't look anything like uh, they weren't described anything like anthropomorphic dummies as uh, like the Air Force wants you to believe. Because the Air Force story is complete, absolute nonsense. It's bogus, bogus, total, absolute bogus. <sighs> But anyhow, uh, yeah, let this Casper the Friendly Ghost. That's what he looks like. And then you look at the dummies. You see what they look like. And uh, here, how about uh, there, there? There's a picture. You know, Leonard Stringfield, uh, the late investigator. Uh, there was uh, he had talked to a doctor in, uh, who claimed that in the 1950s had uh, done an autopsy for the for the government on one of these alien bodies. And uh, and that this this is based on that description that was provided to Stringfield. Stringfield drew several drawings, and then finally he came. He he the the final version of the drawing is what you're seeing right here on the screen. This is and the doctor that did the autopsy said yes, that's what it looks like. Now that thing there looks a lot more. Uh, in the range of the Casper the Friendly Ghost than the anthropomorphic dummies. But again, the dummy story can't be, you can't even consider it anyway. Because again, all these people that I'm talking about here, all these, the witnesses I just laid out, the ones that weren't mentioned at all in the uh, Air Force's 1997 report on this, uh, this ha they were, they're talking about Roswell in 1947 and there's no time compression involved here. No, they were stationed in Roswell in 1947 and a lot of these people weren't there after that. They were gone soon after, soon after. So the dummy story is complete, absolute hogwash. It's complete, absolute, complete nonsense. Uh, one other thing I want to talk about here. There were other witnesses as well, other civilian witnesses that the Air Force didn't even consider when they were putting this report together. Because had they considered them, had they included them, then that would again just completely eliminate, destroy their 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 dummy story. And those witnesses were Pete and Ruben Anaya, who uh, they 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 were good friends back in 1947, throughout their whole lives actually, uh, with uh, little uh, Joe Montoya. Uh, Montoya was a lieutenant governor in New Mexico at the time, and he had called them up one day in, 19, in July 1947 and told them to come pick him up over at the hangar over at the Army Air Base. So they went over there, and he got in the car, and he was all freaked out. And he told them that he saw alien bodies. He saw alien bodies, too, four of them, and one of them was still alive. So... Again, this is all of this stuff has been out there. All of this stuff is in books that you could read and you could that, that has been well researched by people like uh, Donald Schmidt and, and, and Thomas Carey and uh, Kevin Randall. A lot of people have been looking into this for a long time, and uh, it's it's time to move on. It's time to get over this hump. The, the Air Force is done. I mean, the story is over. It's over. We're done. We've reached end game here. They're they're they're. they're the the balloon story is 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 smashed into a million pieces here and the dummy story it's it's over it's over we've reached end game it's done it doesn't count 
It doesn't count. But yet, when you go and you look at uh, the Arrow report, let's go through the Arrow report again, uh, the pertinent part where it talks about Roswell. Uh, here's what the results. Uh, it taught, all it did was basically regurgitate what the Air Force has already stated. They talked about the Roswell report, uh, the one that was put together in 1994. And uh, they also talked about the dummies for the Roswell report case closed. It says here, uh, the results, it says uh, they didn't bother, Arrow didn't even bother to do any further investigation. They just relied on what was already done by the Air Force. And then they act like the, the, there was no need to even do it. It says here, the re it says results, uh, let's, well, let me scroll up a little bit here. It says results, the report stated that the United States Air Force's research did not locate or develop any information that indicated the Roswell incident was a UFO event, nor was there any cover-up by the United States government. Rather, the materials recovered near Roswell were consistent with the balloon of the type used, then, used in the then-classified Project Mogul. No record showed any evidence that the United States uh, government recovered aliens or extraterrestrial material. Well, based on what I just talked about, though, with the witnesses that I just presented, not the the ones that were excluded uh, by the Air Force in their report, it clearly shows that the, there were alien people were seeing aliens there. Clearly. Uh, anyway, continuing here, it says the United States Air Force subsequently published a follow up follow on report in 1997, the Roswell report case closed with additional materials and analysis, which supported its conclusion that the debris recovered near Roswell was from the United States Army Air Force's balloon borne program. The alleged alien uh, <laughs> and that, that's <laughs> the alleged alien bodies reported by some in the New Mexico desert were test dummies that were carried aloft by U.S. Army Air Force high altitude balloons for scientific research. And also it goes on to say here that reports of military units that allegedly recovered a flying saucer and its crew were descriptions of Air Force personnel engaged in the dummy recovery operations. Claims of alien bodies at the Roswell Army Air Force Hospital were most likely the result of the conflation of two separate incidents, a 1956 KC-97 aircraft accident in which 11 Air Force members lost their lives and a 1959 manned balloon mishap in which two Air Force pilots were injured. Now, what they're talking about there is, okay, uh, in their 1997 case closed report, they they also uh, use some of the uh, testimony of, of the late uh, mortician from Roswell, Glenn Dennis. Glenn Dennis claimed that uh, uh, he went to the base hospital one day and he ran into a nurse that he knew there and... Uh, the nurse got all excited when she saw him and she was all, she looked she looked upset and she told him you better get out of here you're going to get in trouble and the next thing you know he was approached by some some uh, uh, guards who gave him a hard time told him that they, uh, they you know they threatened him and then he got kicked off the base and then later on a, a couple days later he met with this nurse uh, had had some lunch with her and she was still upset and she said that they were doing uh, autopsies on dead alien bodies but somehow the air force wants us to believe in their 1997 report that all oh, this was uh, what happened here he must have got must have got these dates and I even got all mixed up it was uh, there was 11 guys got killed out at Roswell in 1956 and then of course there was this balloon mishap in 1959 where two guys got hurt one guy's head got swallowed up that's what's going on there again complete absolute nonsense absolute bogus and here's another thing just to keep this throw this in mind throw this out there you know uh researchers like uh, uh schmidt and Kerry, they they have impeached dennis because dennis lied to them about a nurse uh he he, he actually when, when he was telling this his story about what happened back in 1947 he said that he couldn't remember the name of the nurse and he, he threw out a name i think it might have been naomi self or something like that uh but he never provided a, a, a name he couldn't remember precisely and he and he also claimed that she got killed he heard he heard later that she got killed she was transferred to england and got killed in a, in a flight in a cra plane crash and I actually, I, I actually uh, do uh, sympathize with the Air Force here a little bit because they actually investigated this and it turned out that Dennis lied. He actually did know the name of the nurse, but he never provided it to any researcher. He said he swore to her that he never would say anything. So the reason that uh, some researchers like, uh, um, like Thomas Carey and Donald Schmidt have impeached him is because he told a lie. He should have told the truth. He should have gave the, gave the name of the nurse I mean, this is the biggest story of all time, right? You should have gave out all the information you had. I don't know. We, nobody really knows who the nurse was. I don't know. The Air Force had put up some uh, uh, possibilities in their report, but who knows, right? But they were basically going on a wild goose chase there. That's what it seems like. Um, but it doesn't matter. As you see, 
they the Air Force stayed away from the military witnesses, right? They stayed away from those witnesses. They stayed away from the Ina, uh, uh, Pete and Ruben Ina, Anaya, who, who were friends with Joe Montoya, right? They stayed away from them because they were in Roswell in 1947, and they were they were told by uh, this guy, uh, by by this lieutenant governor, that he just saw bodies. He was all upset about it too. He was. Uh, they took him when they picked him up at the hangar. They brought him back to one to their house, and he was drinking whiskey. You know, guzzling it out of a bottle he was so upset about what he just saw he couldn't believe it and he told him if you ever tell anybody about this i'll just say that you lie that that, that you're a liar I'll, I'll, I'll you know don't ever tell anybody about it and then there were people that were threatened the air force in these books in these reports they they say that they never threaten anybody but there was too many people that said they were threatened including these uh these the anaya brothers they got threatened uh there was uh, frankie rao who was the daughter of the uh the fire chief at the time she got threatened. She's she, she's now passed on. She said they somebody. She, she actually handled some of the memory metal at a, at the firehouse. She was waiting to get a ride from her dad, and this state trooper showed up with a piece of uh, this memory metal, and, and they were all looking at it. all these people in the firehouse were looking at it. And then a couple of days later, uh, some uh, MP show up, some army personnel show up at the house, and 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 threaten her with a billy club in his hand, say, saying, "If you ever say anything, you, they'll be look picking your bones and out of the sand in the desert." There was a lot of people who were threatened. The Air Force says, "Oh, that would we would ne- balloon crews would never do something like that." Well, we're not talking about balloon crews. We're talking about a cover up of 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 an alien craft uh, of crash crashing. That's what we're talking about here, not balloons. Obviously, you know, I, I, in a way, I can't even, I, I don't blame some of the, uh, some of the people like, uh, like Sheridan Cavett and, and Charles B. Moore, who went along with this, who told the, the line for the Air Force, who basically went on the record and lied for them. I think that they were approached by the Air Force and they felt like they were doing their patriotic duty. I mean, Uncle Sam's knocking on the door. Okay, yeah, they, they, they felt like they're all part of the secret. They're part of the cover-up. So they, it, it's, this is, we're doing our patriotic duty. I think that's what's going on. And the Air Force, I would have to believe, uh, long before the 1990s, I, I'm sure that the Air Force does not have control of this narrative, of the situation. They are not, uh, I, I'm, uh, it, there, there's a control group, or as Richard Dolan liked to say, a secrecy group. Richard Dolan was recently talking on an inter- interview on a show, and he says he likes to use the term secrecy group. I always say secret control group. Whatever the case, there's a control group that's that's in charge of this, and I don't think it's the Air Force. I think the Air Force was feeling heat at the time in the 1990s, and they didn't like the idea of them having the finger pointed at them, so they felt like felt it necessary that they had to come up with an excuse, and so they come out with these reports. And as you can see, unfortunately for the Air Force, the reports are completely bogus. You could punch it. You could, there's more holes in these reports than a block of swiss cheese and the whole balloon story is complete absolute bogus and and most certainly the dummy stories complete absolute nonsense absolute nonsense as you could plainly see other witnesses were there stationed in 1947 talking about short little beings with big heads big eyes no dummies these dummies aren't that you look at them that has people wouldn't make that mistake. They're the same thing as a mannequin. Mannequins were around for a long time, decades, a century before this in- incident happened. Life-size uh, mannequins were around. People would not have made that mistake. And and again, the, as as you can plainly see, they didn't even start dropping those those dummies from the sky until the, sometime in the fifties, nineteen fifty four, uh, all throughout Mexico, and it lasted through nineteen fifty nine. It's it's clear. It's right there in front of you. It's been all the information's here. It's all available. What, what what's what mainstream news what are you doing here here it is here here's your here's your story what how come garrett graff what, garrett graff why what, you know in your book here right you're talking about the dummies you you support the air force's dummy story you say it makes sense to you you and and and, and you're telling you're calling yourself a researcher you, you, your book is junk i want my money back i want my money back for your stupid book everybody should demand their money back actually who's the who's the who published this book let's find out should send them a letter. Who is it? Uh, Avid Reader Press, si- uh, uh, an imprint of Simon and Schuster. What are you guys doing to Simon and Schuster? You you just got ripped off. This book is bogus. Yeah, the whole story, the whole Air Force story is bogus. The dummy story is bogus. Everything, that everything, the whole thing is it stinks. It stinks. The whole story stinks. It doesn't make any sense, and it's and it's one big giant fat lie. 
And it's time that we move on from it. And it's time that people in Congress start asking questions about this in particular. This in particular. That story, the dummy story, holds no water at all. At all. You could clearly see it's contrived. It's nonsense. It's time we do something about this. It's time people start, you know, talking about this more. The Ros, something happened in Roswell and it had nothing at all to do with balloons. And most certainly had nothing at all to do with anthropomorphic crash test dummies at all. The story is, is, the story is absolute, the story from the Air Force on all of this is nonsense. Total nonsense. Anyway, I want to say uh, thank you all for joining me today. Until next time.